it's if you ever thought about you know did i understand what i just read or um you know how could i approach that problem in a different way or something like that you're, you're using metacognition where the thoughts are the subject of your thoughts right and, and this is important not just because it helps us give us that introspection to to recognize what we know but also to recognize uh, what we don't know. So historically, metacognition has been kind of broken down into these two sub processes. And this gets really, really deep. And there's, you know, decades of literature about this topic. But essentially, metacognition is broken down into metacognitive knowledge. And that's the knowledge that you have about your own learning processes, right? You know, how do you think um, the strategies that you can use to improve your own metacognition uh, how do you assess uh, a task and how you approach that task and things like that, right? You have to have the knowledge of these skills to develop these skills. And then uh, the other aspect is metacognitive regulation. This is a little bit trickier, um, but this is essentially the, the, the processes that you use to monitor and control your cognition, your thinking. So again, when you're approaching a problem, how do you plan? How do you manage all that information? Uh, you know, your concept match and how do you evaluate uh, the progress and goals that you're setting for yourself, right? So obviously this is super important to medical education. Uh, the ACGME uh, lists practice-based learning and improving competency as a, as a core competency of medical training, as do many other accrediting institutions. And they state that residents must demonstrate the ability to investigate and evaluate their care of patients and to continuously improve patient-based care or care based on constant self-evaluation and lifelong learning, right? So um, I, I think a lot of times, you know, we have trainees that, that maybe are showing deficits in clinical knowledge or clinical reasoning, but it really is, is deficits in their metacognitive skills. And these are things that are very rarely taught uh, in medical education programs. And obviously this has real world implications for the quality of care delivered, right? And ha helping our trainees uh, developing that clinical reasoning. And just as an example, this was a very small study uh, about 10 years ago um, where they used reflective reasoning, which is a, a metacognitive process to combat availability bias, uh, which is a cognitive bias, uh, internal medicine residents and internal medicine residents showing that uh, they can improve diagnostic accuracy with these metacognitive techniques. Uh, so on my last slide, really, I'm just going to kind of highlight uh, a couple of metacognitive techniques that you guys can kind of think about. Uh, the kind of most common one is probably reflection is just where we kind of sit back and, and we think about um, what, you know, how could something have gone better? How did we approach that problem? What can we do better next time? I often use something like this when um, a fellow in the inner ICU just had a, a really tough family conversation and asked him to think about, you know, what they said, what their performance was, and what they could have done differently, maybe. Um, so just examples like that. Concept mapping, it just allows for visual representation of information. So if you want to talk about, you know, an approach to acute neuropathies, you know, you can talk about the infectious ones, the immediate ones, the, you know, et cetera, the toxic ones, and, and kind of, you know, draw those out on, on, on a concept map. Think aloud strategies are pretty common. And I would encourage our, our faculty to, to use this more often, you know, during rounds. I think there's a lot of value in having our learners kind of understand the thought process of, of our senior faculty members and how they approach problems. Cognitive debiasing is essentially just acknowledging that there are cognitive biases out there. There's there's plenty of them, and 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 um and kind of forcing yourself to to acknowledge that and 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 stop yourself from kind of falling into those tracks and almost kind of argue against yourself. And then the five whys is just an interesting one that I throw in here, uh, that with any problem you approach, you, sh you should ask yourself why five times, right? So the patient has an intracerebral hemorrhage, why? Because of hypertension, why? Well, because of Charcot-Bruchard aneurysms that form and why and, and so on and so forth. And just kind of see how deep that you can go. So with that, uh, I'll challenge you guys to, to, to think about how you think about your, 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 the clinical problems that you face and then to think about how that might inform your teaching uh, during you know, bedside teaching or small group sessions um, or things like that. And that is all I have. Thank you, Christian.